episode of Let's Talk Golf. I'm your host, PGA professional Mark Guttenberg. Let's Talk Golf is a bi-weekly podcast featuring all things golf. This week's guest is one of the smartest guys I know. Pat McGuire has done something very few teaching pros have ever done by franchising a teaching operation and training over 20 academy instructors at six different facilities in Virginia and Pennsylvania while founding the Raspberry Golf Academy. Pat's entrance to golf began under the tutelage of his college coach, the Middle Atlantic PGA Education Chairman, Rick Miller. After a two-year apprenticeship under Rick, Pat began his education, development, and career in teaching. Pat was able to work with and under top 100 instructors and for the second largest golf school in the country called the Resort Golf Schools. Pat has coached six world-ranked golfers, including European Tour Championship Paul Peterson, as well as nationally ranked juniors and amateurs as well. In this episode, we get to dive into one of the most innovative minds in golf instruction and follow his journey that led him to founding the Raspberry Golf Academy. Welcome back to the show. Well, today I have a guest here who contacted me about 19 years ago as a young assistant at Loudoun Country Club, wanted a golf lesson. He was already a proven player and he was playing pretty good, but he needed a little insight, second pair of eyes. So this gentleman's name, as you know in the intro, is Pat McGuire. So Pat, I want to welcome you to Let's Talk Golf. We got a lot to cover. Welcome to the show. Mark, thanks for having me. Okay, Pat, so take us back to your early beginnings in golf. When did you first pick up a golf club? Uh, my grandfather took me out to play um, when I was probably six or seven, uh, mainly because I was in trouble. <laughs> um, my parents learned right away that uh, I was always outside, always in athletics, multi-sport athlete, and uh, my grandfather was very strict. My father was also strict. He was, they're both former military guys. And uh, to go out there and spend four hours with them on the golf course was boring, and it would it would almost inspire me not to get in as much trouble. <laughs> um, so my first introduction to the game wasn't through the love of the game or any other reason, but I ended up falling in love with the game. You know, it, it, it was such a personal battle versus a physical battle that you have in other sports. Uh, so my dad kind of reintroduced and actually um, get got me a lesson as a junior at nine. So that's when I really feel like the first time I played clubs and then I got my own set of clubs at probably 11 and I really didn't start playing until I broke my ankle uh, in soccer in high school and then uh, golf was my sport. Wow. Well, when did you know or decided that you wanted to actually make a career in golf? Um, my roommate in Virginia Beach when I was working after college in athletic retail was a, a PGA pro uh, down in Virginia Beach. And I was looking at his situation compared to mine. I, yeah, I made more income than he did, but he was having way better of a time. I was always, always viewed myself as a teacher uh, and a coach. Uh, I coached soccer for juniors, and, and I said, you know, I love golf. Um, to be around it all day as a career, I said, I, I couldn't believe they actually paid people to do what we do for a living, you know, <laughs> at that time. Um, now I don't think they pay us enough, but at the end of the day, um, that's, that's kind of what me, uh, got me into the business because I'd had some injuries from other sports and um, those were all behind me. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted to really pursue a career that I felt like I could make a difference. Well, that, that's a good story and a, and a similar one to mine and a lot of other young, young people growing up. Did you ever have visions of being a tour player? I did. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I met Greg Rose at a seminar, which was called Advantage Golf. I don't know if you remember that. I do. <clears throat> it was before the, the uh, TPI uh, mm -hmm. craze hit. And uh, Greg had come up to me and said, hey, I noticed that you have some weird movement. And Greg was a chiropractor at the time. And I was seeing him for chiropractic after the, the seminar on, um, on biomechanics and all that stuff. And um, he found something in my ankle and sent me to a specialist and went to a specialist and my left ankle had all the tendons and ligaments had frayed in it from soccer injuries and basketball injuries. And I had this guy, actually the same guy that fixed uh, Orothobel's foot and Fluff's foot do surgery on my foot and I was in a cast for about 16 weeks. It was very not fun. And I got out of that cast. I was working at Loudon at the time and, and the minute they cut that thing off, I was 50 yards longer. Wow. And I really, as a coach and as a player, I understood, well, maybe there's a connection between what your body can do and what your swing can do. 
And a few of the members over there encouraged me, and uh, so I kind of tipped my hat and said, okay, I'm going to get my game ready, start playing more in the section. Was able to, to, to play well in the section. Um, I had a good run on the APA, which is Assistant Pros Association of Golf Tournaments. Uh, I finished like sixth in the section that year, had, had a few wins, big wins. Um, started scoring really low, uh, which was, I think, the big key to try to be a professional. And then I went down to Q School and didn't have luck at Q School. Unfortunately, I got rained out in Houston. And then I missed uh, going to the second stage by two shots in um, Florida. And then I got injured. And that mm. was kind of the end of the end of the run. I played some mini tours and I played, uh, did some Monday qualifiers. I, I was able to probably play a total of six legitimate tour events on either web or nationwide. Um, played in some national club pro stuff uh, and, and uh, Pinehurst and Bermuda and uh, down in Charleston, uh, we used to have a national pro-am. Uh, for, I think it was a four day and you played Kiowa. Um, nice. So, but when I hurt my back, uh, the doctor said, I'm done. And uh, luckily I found a guy that said, mm, you not, might not be done, but just might not be, the next couple of years might be challenging. And uh, so uh, I slipped in L4 and got a lot of treatment and luckily didn't need surgery. So. But it really did end. It, it changed the way physically I could move, and I went from you know kind of a short hitter before the ankle to a long hitter, and then I was kind of back to medium. And it was just like I was always feeling like I'm doing something wrong because I don't hit it the way I used to. Um, so played in a few more section events, and then really just turned the gas on the the career of teaching, and the business of teaching. Very very good. You know what you say is really important. People don't understand how how your body affects your swing. And so many people just try to give golf lessons on, on what they read in a book or something. Right. But with, you know, just listening to you and, t and hearing that story, I said, boy, he started to use the ground a little more. Oh, he started yeah. to be able to use his feet a little more. He couldn't do that before. Right. Probably some of the instruction you were getting was making it even worse. Right. But let's move on. That's a great little uh, bio there. You know, Pat, in my opinion, you're kind of like a pioneer in the Middle Atlantic section when it comes to franchising and, and founding the Raspberry Golf Academy, as we talked about in the intro, which currently includes six different facilities in uh, in Virginia and Pennsylvania. Is that Correct. true? Yes. Can you name each facility and, and its location? Sure. And, and, you know, just as a caveat to that, I mean, we have Raspberry Golf Academy locations at all the RGM courses. Um, so you're at Augustine, Old Hickory, Bull Run, and Raspberry Falls. We also have a location at Virginia Golf Center and then Royal Manchester Golf Links. And that's in Pennsylvania. Correct. Uh, for the last three or four years, we had been running a, um, the Golf Academy at Lansdowne, a uh, private resort in Leesburg, uh, under two names. Obviously, we, we ran it as our staff and our processes and programs. Um, and um, that was for a company called Troon, which manages that facility. And they've had some recent changeover. Uh, unfortunately, I made the decision to leave that property just because the – general manager there wanted to go in a different direction than I wanted to go in. I wanted to stick to teaching and making people better. Um, and uh, so we just kind of moved our operations back over to, to Raspberry Falls. So we, we have one location down. I've been talking to several others, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the number we have. I just like to make those better. Very good. Well, tell us why you decided to do this and, and what's your mission statement for, for forming these academies? Well, I mean, the mission statement's the easy one. It's it's when I was young enough, um, you know, being around military, and, and my dad was a Special Forces uh, Army Ranger and meeting a bunch of Navy SEALs and different guys, and you, you get a different mindset from them how driven they are. And, again, what they're driven towards is very different than what I was doing. Um, but I said, well, if I'm going to get in the golf business, I want to help lower the national handicap. And I said the only way to do that would be to teach teachers and to learn enough to be able to teach my peers and uh, even even guys that I respect very much like yourself and be in a situation where I can collaborate with some of the best and come up with better programs and better ideas, not necessarily better than anyone else's, but better for the customer. So I kind of put that customer first and said, how do I actually help people with such a difficult, complicated game? And I said, well, I think if I got better information and a better environment for the teachers, and a better environment and a, and a better situation for the for the golfers that I would be able to succeed. And so I was like, I have to to be able to go find locations that are convenient because, as you know, I mean, you've been very successful and people will fly all over from all over the country and the world to see good instructors. And some people won't drive 10 miles. 
And it, it, it just blows my mind um, when someone says, well, that's too far away. And, you know, but it, again, that yeah. tells you about their passion in the game. So kind of getting back on that topic. So that what drives me, what wakes me up every morning is trying to make a difference. And um, Ken Venturi actually said something. I was at a pro-am at the, used to be at Avenel uh, when it was the Kemper. And the president of Loudon, uh, Kevin Clark, uh, and I had a, an agreement if he played in the pro-am, I'd caddy for him. Well, afterwards, I get invited into the tent. Normally, you don't get into the tent, and we're sitting there, and Ken Venturi's at the table, and one of the things he said was, you know, you should be an asset to the game. And I thought about that, and I said, yeah, I want to leave a mark and say, you know, if, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, I accomplished this, which is more than just a student shooting a career low round or somebody winning. It was like, really make a difference to people, and I think that's information. They're smart guys yourself, and we have, we're lucky to have a lot of good uh, professionals in our section. I, I know you. I'm honored to be on this show. Uh, you know, when you see Erica Larkin and Steve Bosdosh and some of the people you've you've had on your show, yourself included, and your wife, uh, to be able to sit there and say, you know, if I can get the right information to some of those minds who can affect hundreds and thousands of people, is much better than me just in my little cubicle working with that one student. Absolutely, spread the word. You know, I I love that. I I think you've done a lot of what you said and. You know, it's one thing to just hang your name in a shingle that says, this is a Raspberry Golf Academy, but you, but you are so involved. In fact, you have an ongoing training of uh, Raspberry Golf Academy instructors. Uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what that's like, you know, what months you do the training, uh, and, and then answer the question. After the training, uh, the obvious question to me would be, do all your instructors teach the same way? And I, I'd like you to clarify that sure. for us as well. Well, I, I'll start with, the latest is we did um, what I call performance coaching. Um, but in the past, what we'd spend is pretty much the entire year except for the 10 weeks during junior programs. So in the summer when the kids are out, we're so busy, the quality of me being able to get enough staff there for two or three hours. So that the goal was always to once a week have a you know four to six hour session where there was some collaboration and some prepared material as to saying whether we're going over technology, we'll have sales reps come in and, and, and educate us on equipment and fitting. Uh, I'll have experts in the mind, nutrition, fitness come in. And then uh, a lot of the seminars or, or training sessions I'll be doing from stuff that I've learned over my career of being a guy that went out and wanted to learn new stuff all the time and constantly trying to, to, to learn what is, what is it that makes people better. And, um, so that's been very successful. We've had you know, a lot of the coaches that have attended those and, and applied those um, have been able to translate that into student success. So we've been very fortunate. And to answer your other question, I think you had three, but the second one that I remember was, do all our teachers teach the same? And I said, uh, you know, that was one of my big pet peeves. And I said, absolutely not. I said, uh, the one thing that I always wanted to provide it is variety. You know, so that that student could either relate to the coach or know that they had a selection, that we were a team of coaches and that if this person was too technical, you could go to someone else on the staff, you didn't have to leave and go to another property, that you say, okay, maybe this person's more fee oriented, this person's more of a coach, uh, this person is, is, is more into the holistic side of the game. So I, I've tried very hard to not have a bunch of people that are cookie cutter and teach the exact same thing until recently. And I'll tell you why I switched. Um, I was anti uh, that until I realized that so many people struggle from the same things that we've identified like six or seven areas of the game that we said, okay, well, as a performance coach, and what is a performance coach? I'll take a second to define that, is, is a coach that understands the bigger picture. So I view an instructor as someone that understands technique very well, mechanics, uh, there's someone you go to to fix or change your movements. Uh, I view a coach as someone who gets the best out of whatever you have, but may not be as involved in the mechanical changes. So they, they might not be as up to date on technology or whatever, but they get their students better somehow to score better, play better, lower their handicap. Um, and then I, you know, I teach heavily in process. So I, I started saying, well, you have to be a good teacher. So I was like, I really, I think for you to be a performance coach, you have to be all three. So you have to be able to educate, whether that be through materials and information in a classroom setting, on a whiteboard, giving someone new information that's maybe not with a golf club in their hand. They're not hitting balls. But you're really educating the brain of saying, you know, 
if you hit the ball in the club face in this area, this is what's supposed to happen. And a lot of people don't even understand contact. Um, and I don't think that's always necessarily in, in an instructor's preview. It's like, well, you want to be in this position or have this pattern. Well, they completely miss impact. Or uh, someone that's focused on this misses that. So I said, okay, well, I want to educate uh, these folks. So out of all of our coaches, we had uh, eight get through to the testing phase and seven of them passed. Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm self-proclaimed master certified <laughs> performance coach um, only because I couldn't find anyone else that, that had that well-rounded. Uh, I have a team of professionals I work with that deal with mental and nutrition and fitness, sports science. So I was able to you know, kind of borrow their information in the certification. So those coaches then got the programs that we designed that specifically deal with short game, putting, full swing, um, uh, wedge play, 130 yards and in. Um, so we designed programs, uh, one of them called Find Your Number, which specifically gets into the very basics of like, how far do you hit the ball? Um, you know, what is your skill level really in this? Because I don't think a handicap really defines a player. You know, low 10 out of the last 20, you're, you, you can't, you know, really put the score you shot, you have to adjust it. So I felt like us coming up with a skill score was more important than a handicap because you know you could go out and play a good round your handicap would fluctuate and you play a bad round your handicap doesn't move but skill is pretty much the same day in and day out and as you know as mark is a competitive golfer and uh, you know one day you're putting well one day you're not but over time you have an average right and <clears throat> because we've collected all this data we kind of know like you know uh, someone with a score of seven or higher should be playing professionally would be a really good club pro good mini tour player someone in the seven five eight point oh across all their skills would be you know a top 200 player in the world so we have kind of a combine way of assessing player skill um that takes all that other stuff that's uh you know objective or subjective out and says well no this is just your ability to hit a shot and mm -hmm. we use technology to track that and score it uh, and it's proven very well so we've been able to predict and find players that uh that are that are able to perform at a much higher level than the maybe the naked eye would see so i've been able to pick kids that i was like mm, you know no one sees the talent in this kid but i've been able to see the talent in that kid through using this process so that's what i've trained the coaches on so in that we all evaluate the same now we all um score the same now so it doesn't matter which one of these eight coaches you go to you get the exact same product but they still coach different some of them are more instructors some of them more teachers some of them more coaches and so you still get some variety um, how they do it is still individual to that coach to kind of get back to the point but you would get and at least i would hope if you came down here and got evaluated by tim uh, on your skill set it would be the same score if you came up and got evaluated by me or you went to uh, john wright or john miller or saying you would get the same score it wouldn't be this you know you know in our business there's no standard so I try to standardize that and say, okay, this is the skill. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pursue taking that to another level as well so more pros have access to that information. That is so good. You know, I, I, the certification program is, is taking it to the next level. I know you've had like 20 instructors. And, and just for people that may be confused if they go on their website and they see me or Leslie on the website, we came to uh, Bull Run knowing it was a Raspberry Golf Academy and knowing – that it was a top-notch facility. All of your facilities are just loaded to the gill with science and technology for those that want to use it and right. that's those that don't. So the nice thing about you, Pat, is allowing me to be who I, I am. You, you offered me the training. I was really anxious to learn, and I've been to a couple sessions, but I didn't follow that path, but not because it's not good, because I learned great stuff from it, just because I had so many other things going in my direction. But well, plus you probably forgot more than, than I know in the amount of time you've been doing this. Well, you know, my favorite quote from Bill Strasbaugh, the late Bill Strasbaugh, who was a great mentor to me, was those who dare to teach must never cease to learn. Right. So once you think you know everything, you're, you're way behind the times already. Right. And so I, I like the fact that you offer so much science and technology, even coming from an old school background, I try to expose myself to that. So touch briefly on... Going to a Raspberry Golf Academy, what are some of the science and technology applications you have to offer students? Sure. Um, well, um, you know, I'll start from the basic from the ball. Um, 
with the invention of launch monitors and their improvement, uh, we have the ability to track the ball from the minute you hit it to the minute it lands or stops. Um, certainly there's some... That with FlightScope, TrackMan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there's several different products out there. I happen to be on the advisory board of FlightScope. Uh, when I was in Phoenix, we had both models. I, I tended to use FlightScope more because it had more of a science base. I think uh, TrackMan's very good for player base, kind of very you know simple, simplified, I think their software. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think when you when you really get into it, the hardware is the same. It's really just you know it's like whether you use an iPhone or an Android phone. It's like really they both do the same thing. It, they have the same technology, but personal personal preference. So uh, so that tracks the ball, and that gives us as as teaching professionals or fitters way better information. Um, you know, there's some anomalies, and there's a lot of software in there. So if you really dig in, and uh, but but it it smooths out the information, so we're no longer guessing. So whether you're working on direction the ball is going in and you can get some information on d-plane or face the club relationship or contact point uh you're working on distance you want to see speed and height and spin on the ball um you know if you're fitting for a club and you're looking for patterns of right or left it's much easier to go to that machine and see the technology track those shots and tell you and you're like oh okay versus you have to physically write it down or have stand out in the range like the old school and okay that one went this far or this far left um, there are some flaws in the technology and we've kind of learned around those because, you know, even as smart as the technology is, where you aim the machine is the zero line and students How don't. good the range ball is when they're right. hitting it. Right, and know, the wow. students don't always aim where you want them to aim, as you well know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've given a few sure. lessons on alignment <laughs> or aim. Uh, so that's one of the main uh, tools we use to track the ball. We use uh, two different products to track the body under 3D. Um, a lot of people use biomechanics, and I, I think that's misused in a lot of cases. So, so in, in Raspberry, we use it to measure the efficiency, uh, energy, and force output of a player uh, to be able to come back and say where are their areas of opportunity to either improve their swing in those phases or prevent injury. Because uh, you'll see certain things like if your body's moving in certain ranges, you're eventually going to hurt your back, your neck, your shoulder, your arm, or your wrist. So it's a great tool to measure movement of the body. And then when you use that in combined with a, with a launch monitor or flight scope in our case, you actually see how the ball is responding. So you can actually figure out a better way for that player to move to create the shot they're looking to do without injuring themselves or at least being able to repeat it. Um, uh, we use uh, pressure, pressure mats. Um, body track? Or? Yes. Uh, body track is integrated with flight scope, so it's the easy one to right. use. Uh, I've used Kessler and... Some of the other systems that are more advanced, uh, you almost need a PhD to read the graphs. Mm -hmm. um, but w what I've done is, is, is simplified it, I've stayed away from force production into the ground. When you're dealing with a customer, that's too scientific for them. They're, you know, you want to translate that into a feel. But uh, pressure is a very good thing because a lot of people can feel where they're, you know, once you can get them to feel and be aware of where the pressure is in their feet, you eventually can get to the force production from that. So. Um, we use focus band, which is actually relatively oh, old technology. Uh, I actually started using that about 12 years ago, a uh, group out of Australia, and it measures conscious, subconscious, which side of the brain you're using, how focused you are, uh, kind of your, 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 the quietness of your body. So uh, that, that one's pretty, pretty big. We don't use it a lot, actually, because a lot of it you can see. If you really pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Um, Video is still used. I think that's we use it for swing style and basic positions. I, I, I would say I use video 90% of the time to figure out what other technology I need to use. Um, yeah. Only because the video doesn't really give me a sense of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it's 2D, I can't really see. So we use multiple camera angles at the same time. It gives us a little more information. Uh, some of our coaches use video a lot. They're very in the swing style. Um, KVS too, right? That's well, KVS, KVS and AMM do the 3D. So yeah, exactly. um, we use some of those technologies to measure tempo. Uh, I've started to use some of that technology to measure innate swings versus manipulated swings to see the difference in players. Uh, because the, the, the timing and the speed of those are so good, you get much better information. Wow. So you guys leave no stones unturned. You know, it, it's funny you mentioned that thing about alignment and technology. Just to give you an example. Years ago, I used to work with Billy Hurley III, who's yep. on tour now. And uh, I was down in Florida, and he was having trouble aiming. And we spent two hours on the range just working on alignment. Where, which direction his eyes were looking at? Where is he looking when he's setting the club? 
two hours with no technology. I could have probably cut through that in about 20 minutes if, right. I, if I'd had all that stuff, but it just goes to show you how, how much in-depth detail Raspberry Golf Academy goes into when, you, when you're working with people. All right, so what I'd like to do is just kind of briefly uh, mention a few of your programs. You've touched on a couple of them already. Uh, what's your number? I, I want you to just give me a little bit of a brief synopsis about these programs that you offer. Right. Um, what's your number you've already touched on? What's the no-brainer program? So <clears throat> I was a Pell's disciple. Uh, as a young apprentice and a, as an instructor, I was lucky enough to do a few guest instructor spots uh, when they had camps in Florida where I was working at Pine Tree and some of the courses I worked down in Wellington. And so I got so immersed in what he did because of the science. You know, he's an engineer, NASA guy, and I guess I have a scientific mind when it comes to some things. I try not to teach that way, but I'm very yeah. interested in learning why things work. Mm -hmm. And um, so he had a clock system. And one day I said, is there a better way to do this? but use all the good things Dave Pels designed. And what I found was that players in, uh, innately take a certain length and rate swing. And I said, well, why don't I measure that first? Uh, them just taking a natural length swing and see how far the ball goes versus getting them to take it a certain distance back to formulate the shot. So that was the start of the no-brainer. And I started teaching that to people about seven years ago. And then I started having more success. My students started getting better, less chunks, less, so originally it kind of started fixing tempo problems. Um, but what it, what it came out was that people were landing the ball within like a foot of each other. I'd have them hit 10 shots and the furthest apart the they would be in the air is like three feet. I was like, wow, that's really good. I mean, that's like tour that's level. we're after, yeah. Um, and I was like, and this person's a 20 handicap. So I'm like, well, if they can do that without all the manipulation, without all the confusing, I said, maybe that's what we should teach. So we, we kind of designed a natural mark Pat, this is your length. You don't have to go to a position, and it produces X, and then you have a shorter and a longer version. And then we started cycling through different width stances, uh, different setups, and it just evolved and evolved and evolved, and it just went off common sense. It went off things that are like, uh, a lot of people don't understand how the ball spins and how to get the ball to react to the ground different, the things we can control that aren't necessarily done through technique that are more done through setup and require less manipulation in the swing. So we designed a, I say we because trial and error, students helping me learn what didn't work, um, and then some of the other coaches within RGA and, and coaches that I respect and worked with over the years have been able to refine that. Oh, that's great. So what about Project 130? So uh, Oscar Kotsia, who is my partner working with our tour pros, um, came to me and said, we have to make our players better. Um, from 130 and in. They're afraid of going long. They're scared. They're not scoring with their wedges. And it's just, I think it's more a generational thing. I think uh, most of the young players today have developed a lot of anxieties that players of our age or older don't, didn't ever had. They just accepted a bad shot as a bad shot. And now it's like unacceptable. So I really dug in and I re reverse engineered from where the ball finishes back to impact. And, um, scientifically came up with, well, what height do you need to hit it to make it go this yard? How solid do you have to hit it? And then we started teaching uh, innately uh, our touring pros how to control distance. And what we found, and of course, I guinea pigged it on some higher handicappers and some mid handicappers, and what we saw was amazing results. And as a matter of fact, Paul Peterson, who's one of the touring pros I coach, um, just finished the second version of uh, Project 130 before he won. And if you go look at his stats that week, his wedge game was by far, like I think seven feet closer on average than any other player in the field. Uh, and he won that tournament by hitting wedges close and making putts. Uh, he laid up on par fives where he could reach, almost like a Zach Johnson in the Masters, because he was so confident that he might even hole out. So uh, that's what that system's designed, is to give you really accurate numbers and tendencies that you can do from 130 yards into about 50 yards. Good stuff, good stuff. You know, uh, one of the things about technology that, that I actually love, and, and you're just a perfect example of technology doesn't give you solutions, but it measures things. Right. It gives you accurate information so that you don't waste your time with a lot of stuff that you don't need. So you've got some great programs. What's your number? No-brainer. Project 130, another one called Path to the Tour. 
go on to the website, uh, Raspberry Golf Academy, for those of you who want to learn more about these programs, because there's, there's tons of them that are going to make you better. So, Pat, you've had success with players of all level, including European Tour winner Paul Peterson, as, as well as uh, I think you have at least five other world-ranked players. Uh, is it different working with top amateurs versus tour professionals? Like, you know, it's funny that you asked that question because um, I got asked that uh, recently when I was over uh, during some of the Rolex series in Europe. And I said, beginners and touring pros are almost the same thing because they both have hope. Mm. Everyone in the middle is very different. And um, I think I think the perspective and some of the things that the let's say an elite level amateur compared to a intermediate level golfer and by everyone's definition, that's different. Um, but if I'm coaching, uh, I just started coaching a young man, uh, um, Connor uh, McCafferty, that came to me and wanted to become a better amateur in the state. And I said, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really working with anybody in that set, so I want to help you. And his expectations, the kid's talented, um, but his expectations are so high and his patience is so low. And you never find that with good touring pros. They've been through the bumps and the bruises. They know what to expect. So they're not surprised. And beginners think they stink. <laughs> and so they have, once they hit a good shot, they get that spark. You know, I'm sure you had it. First real solid shot you hit. You're like, wait a minute, this game's... Uh, so I, th I think, you know, if I had to say that, I think you're going to learn more about coaching with a touring pro because there's so much pressure. I mean, I've never, until I started coaching, you know, legitimate guys. Like, Paul makes a living playing golf. He pays his bills playing golf. You don't want to mess up as the coach. You don't, you, you don't want to guess and give him information that might not be wrong. And not to say we do that, but sometimes, you know, we'll ad lib, we'll fill little things in, and you can't do that at that level. Yeah. I mean, because someone else will prove you wrong. And trust me, between the internet and you've seen the, it's like a wolf pack. As soon as you publish something or say <laughs> yeah. something and it's repeated, it, it, it I mean, I, I could tell you some horror stories. But um, I think if, if more people worked on mindset and process in the middle, um, it would be very similar. Um, obviously, the pros have way more time. So they have, they have time on a daily, weekly basis to, to address all their issues, and amateurs don't. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest difference to me. Is, uh, I, I coach players that are 20 handicapped, so they have all the physical and skill that a, the touring pro has. They just don't have the time. Well, speaking of time and schedule, we're, we're coming near the end, but I wanted to ask you what your schedule is like week to week, month to month. That's probably a whole show in itself. but. Right. Typically, I mean, I know you're all over the place. You just give us, like, last week. What was last week like? Well, last week I was in Kansas at the USGA Junior uh, Amateur with Ryan Smith, one of my students. Uh, we were lucky enough to finish uh, eighth. Nice. Uh, so he made it through the stroke play into the match play. We beat uh, a couple really good players that are uh, – they changed the rules, so it's 18 and under now. So he's playing a lot of older kids. He's 15. Did you caddy for him? Yeah, I did. Oh, nice. So caddy and coach, it was, a, it was an interesting experience kind of wrestling around with him and getting him to, to play. But he played very well. Uh, and I literally had just gotten off a plane from Ireland where I was over at the Irish Open. And the week before, I was in France. And the week before, I was – but I don't normally travel that much in that condensed period. But it was a very important time in, in uh, Paul's career because he had three Rolex events in a row. And he had been struggling, so we kind of got him out of what he was doing, and he played well. He had a good finish in Ireland, his best uh, finish in a Rolex event. And then obviously very important uh, for Ryan. But I, I just plan on being busy. So I, I plan on working 12 hours a day. And when I get off early or get extra time, it's great. Uh, and I have a lot of people that keep me busy. Um, but I like to work. Well, you're great at everything that you do. I mean, you know, I, I know whenever I want to reach Pat, I, I usually say uh, – well, I'm, I'm going to give up on that for a while because he could be in Ireland, he could be in Kansas, he could be at Virginia Golf Center. Right. I don't know how you do it, but you do a great job of it. So, uh, in, in just wrapping things up, what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about Raspberry Golf Academy and how to contact a Raspberry Golf Academy instructor? Well, I think the website's a great resource. Um, I think all the coaches, uh, they have access to anybody that's involved with us at any properties, uh, obviously yourself included, and Leslie and um, I think the best thing to do, I would tell anybody, is, is go on there, read some profiles, and call the coach. Uh, get their philosophy. Um, you know, right now, I, you know, I'm not taking on a lot of new students. I do a lot of evaluations and refer those to uh, who I think is the best coach for that person. Occasionally, someone will come along and I think, hey, I'm the best coach for them. Um, mine is all scheduled. But I think if you go to Raspberry Golf Club, we have videos on there. There's, there's uh, testimonials on there. 
you can get a good sense of who you're going out to see before you see them. And the good news with us, we're a team. So if you don't really connect with that coach, there might the next bay over, there might be your coach. And uh, obviously at our different locations, Raspberry has the most selection of coaches, but uh, we have 20 coaches in the area you can select from, and I'm sure you can find the right one. Well, Pat, that, that's well said. And I can attest, you know, I've been in the golf business for 43 years as a professional, been teaching. I would have no reservations to send anybody to any Raspberry Golf Academy instructor. You guys from soup to nuts, you do the training, you do the research, you, you have programs, you care about your students, always doing new programs, family fun days. Uh, it's a great organization. I'm, I'm proud to have a little bit of a connection to you, and I just want to thank you again for coming on the show. Well, Mark, thanks. It's my honor to be here, and I uh, appreciate the time. All right. Well, that concludes another episode of Let's Talk Golf. I hope you learned as much as I did from Pat, as he is one of the most innovative golf instructors I've ever met. Make sure to visit their website, raspberrygolfacademy.com. I hope you enjoyed the show, and as always, if you have any feedback, contact me at my website, guttenbergsgolf.com. That's G-U-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G-S dot com. I would appreciate it if you'd subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube, and give us a rating and review. If you have trouble finding us, you can go to my website and hear the show through my Twitter feed. We'll be back in two weeks for another episode of Let's Talk Golf.